Welcome to another episode of Eschatology Matters. Uh, my name is Ryan Eakins, and today we are blessed uh, to have another outstanding guest with us. Uh, if you're not familiar with Eschatology Matters, uh, you can find us on YouTube, uh, online, uh, where you listen to podcasts, um, lots of different places, but we're happy to interact uh, wherever you would choose to do so. But like I said, we are blessed today to have another outstanding guest with us. Uh, Peter Gaiman is here. Peter is a, a professor down at Shepherd's Theological Seminary, um, and he hosts a podcast that uh, some of you might be familiar with. Uh, but Peter, welcome. Thanks for thanks for joining us here. Oh, Ryan, it's a pleasure. I really enjoy what you guys are doing at Eschatology Matters and just happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, Peter, if you would just Give some of our listeners maybe a, a short uh, short bio and a little bit about your background. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, I I really appreciate the opportunity to join you guys. So basically, I grew up in northern Minnesota and uh, didn't like the snow as much as, uh, you know, most people probably don't like the snow. So I hightailed it to California where I... Uh, went to college there at the master's university, and then I played baseball there, loved, loved it, got a business degree. Lord really worked in my heart. I had, I had gotten saved when I was really young, grew up in a solid believing family, which I'm really, really thankful for. But when I was in college, the Lord really changed my heart to really get involved with ministry. And so I started to go to seminary there at master's and had some great mentors, got involved in pastoral ministry, but at the same time had a had a knack for kind of really diving deep into subjects and trying trying to you know teach at an academic level and so I was really thankful for that I was shepherded by a lot of you know really gifted scholars like Dr. Will Barrick, uh, Mike Grisanti those are guys who really poured into my life and I was thankful for them and so uh, yeah I got my uh, masters there, uh, THM and even PhD through through masters. So it's it's kind of funny. I I spent way longer than I thought I was going to in California. But as soon as I graduated, uh, and I met my wife there too. That's a big part of the story. Love love that part of the story. Met my wife. We now have four kids. Just had another one uh, two months ago. So I'm a little sleep deprived still, but it's uh, it's it's worth it, you know. Uh, and then right after I graduated in 2017. We moved down to North Carolina in the Raleigh area where we're at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Love the school. Uh, love it's it's actually a dispensational school, which makes me kind of a unique guest of of sorts here. And uh, yeah, just really happy to talk about some of these issues. And uh, thanks for the invite. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And. Uh... Uh, Peter, you do host a podcast, right? Um, how often um, do you? Yeah, so I, for the podcast, The Bible Sojourner, I started that off as kind of just an alumni ministry for the seminary, but it's grown a lot since then. And I try to record uh, every other week. Um, I basically try to switch off blog posts and and podcast episodes. So it, it's about becomes about every other week for those. Yeah, great. Uh, I know I've, I've caught a few episodes, but uh, if you have not uh, caught Peter's uh, podcast, uh, Please, please do so. Uh, a lot of good stuff on there. Um, but today uh, here on our conversation, uh, our topic is Israel and the church. And we have a couple of goals in this conversation. Um, you know, uh, Peter just kind of mentioned, you know, the position that he's going to be coming from. But you know, our goal here at Eschatology Matters is to engage folks uh, wherever they're at and from whatever background they've come from. Um, and so, for instance, you know, uh, myself coming from a, uh, you know, a, a Baptist covenant theology perspective, we'll be um, talking here today with Peter, and we're probably going to disagree on some things, um, but want to do so uh, charitably. And uh, really, we're just going to allow Peter to kind of shed some light um, on um, kind of how um, he would interpret um you know, some things in regards to Israel and the church. So uh, we'll go ahead and and jump right in for the sake of time. So 
Um, you know, we'll, we'll start Peter. I, I think, you know, I've, I've seen this. I'm sure you have a lot of mischaracterizations when it comes to dispensationalism, right? So, you know, words are important and how we define them are important. So to you, what is dispensationalism? Well, I'm so glad you asked. And uh, I want to say a comment about being invited on here as well, just because I do, I don't just want this to be a passing comment. I really do think that uh, it's really great of you guys to to kind of broaden the conversation and make sure it's done with Christian charity and, you know, put put positions there and test them with scripture. That's what we all all need to be doing. And so I just really think that's that's great. And I know I'm not just saying this. I, I, I really look forward to every episode of Eschatology Matters. I don't listen to them all, but I I love just hearing because you guys are getting some of the top notch guests. And now here I am sneaking in, you know, not a top notch guest, but here well, here it is, you know. So yeah, I, I just think this is the way to do it. So I really think you guys are doing a great job. So on to the topic then, uh, talking about dispensationalism, you know, there's, there's a lot of, I guess, misconstrued ideas about what it is. You know, I've heard, um, I guess even definitions from ranging from multiple ways of salvation to it's inherently antinomian, all these kind of ideas. And I guess at the core, um, this is how I would describe it. Now, again, I love how you said, um, you know, how would you define this? And I think you already keyed in on a special part of this is that dispensationalism is kind of multifaceted and there are different camps within it. And so you're going to get a little bit of a different taste, but the way that I would interpret it, and I take comfort in this because a lot of my colleagues and friends would interpret it this way too. So I'm not just on an Island is that dispensationalism is primarily a commitment to interpreting scripture in line with a literal grammatical and historic hermeneutic. And what I mean by that uh, Mark Snowberger from from Detroit Baptist, uh, he when he talks about a literal grammatical historical hermeneutic, one of the phrases he uses is an originalist hermeneutic. And I really like that perspective, or I like that idea, because a lot of times we can resonate with that. There's so much confusion about what it means to interpret Scripture literally. You know, do we believe Jesus is literally a door? Well, nobody believes that. But do when we're when we're talking about hermeneutics dispensationalism has a presupposition that we are going to interpret scripture in line with a authorial originalist intent and and i think a lot of people are familiar with that because that's kind of a a big discussion that's going on with constitutional law right now too is how do we interpret the constitution and you have you know camps about whether the constitution is a living document that can change meanings or whether you are an originalist and say we have to interpret in line with the authorial intent of the framers of the constitution and so that's how i view dispensationalism is is it's primarily a way of reading scripture and then that's going to necessarily have an outcome certain uh, theological beliefs. And I'm actually, uh, I'm more of a minimalist than a lot of people with regard to what you need to believe to be a dispensationalist. And I think, well, let, let's put it this way. Dispensationalism as a title itself is kind of unhelpful as a name. It's kind of like all millennialism. I mean, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of the viewers here, um, will, will join with me in their hatred of the title all millennialism, right? Because it has nothing to do with what the system actually believes, right? Because there is no, it's not a belief that there's no millennium. It's a specific kind of belief about the millennium. And so it's kind of funny because all millennialism doesn't really describe the belief. And in the same way, dispensationalism doesn't really get at the core of what the belief actually is. And so I think it's helpful to have conversations like this and talk about what do we mean when we're talking about these things. Uh, just to put it in perspective, I don't know. In fact, I was interviewing a couple of my colleagues over the last half a year, just you know, making sure I wasn't out to lunch. And I was asking them, how important are dispensations like to the system of dispensationalism? And, you know, almost to a T, I actually didn't find one person that said, oh, very important. Most said, yeah, nobody cares about that. Nobody cares. And now I still know. So again, this is my branch. This is me talking, right? But I do know there are people who say, yeah, there are seven dispensations, all of those things. Okay. But, but I think for in academic dispensationalism, in, in what is presented now in the higher levels, you know, this idea of needing multiple dispensations isn't really a big, a big part of it. 
And, you know, other things that a lot of people attribute to dispensationalism, for example, the idea of like non-lordship salvation. Well, historically in, in Dallas, that was a big issue. But then somebody like myself, who I think, you know, I lived and breathed and grew up in kind of the MacArthur era of dispensationalism, you know, there was, there was never a time when I, I thought that non-lordship salvation was okay. Now, again, I will freely admit there's still plenty of dispensationalists out there that hold to non-lordship salvation or even free grace theology. And, and, you know, that's their prerogative in one sense, but that's not necessarily inherent to dispensationalism. And that's where I guess one, one of the things that as interpreters, we need to be careful. And I'm guilty as of this as just as much as anybody is, is often tying in specific beliefs to a system when it's not inherently part of that system, it's actually a part of, you know, the people who are in that system. And so when you think about all these mischaracterizations and there's lots of them, you know, I, I guess in one sense, maybe the question is what, what is actually essential to dispensationalism? Like for, so from my view, what does somebody actually have to believe in order to be a dispensationalist? And I think that that's, and again, I, I might be a minimalist on this, but I think that that's a really important question to ask. And so I would say, I'd just give four things. I think on the one hand, you need to, as a dispensationalist, and it, it always goes back to hermeneutics, you need to hold to what I would refer to as passage priority. And that's just the viewpoint that your view of a passage, the meaning of that passage is found in that passage. So in other words, you don't need... And the alternative to that would be something like New Testament priority, which we can talk about later if, if you want. But the point is, we don't need the New Testament. Now, yeah, this will probably require some clarification, but we don't need the New Testament to tell us what the Old Testament means, that in and of itself, the meaning is found there. The New Testament would just clarify and help us understand to a further degree. So passage priority just means that a passage cannot mean what it has never meant in the past. That's basically a presupposition of the hermeneutical process of originalism. And so that would be the big, you know, just, and, and that, if you believe that, um, then you're going to necessarily come up with a couple, you know, distinctions. So one, you would see a difference between Israel and the church, um, because as you're going through the old Testament, you see specific promises given to Israel and you say, well, you know, if it's not clarified or contradicted or challenged in the New Testament, then we should still expect those, even if they're not repeated, even though I would say they probably are repeated. And that's also going to have you believe in a future for ethnic Israel, not just Israel as the church, but as the nation itself, there's, there's going to be a future for them, the geopolitical nation. And then you're also going to believe that those promises take place in a millennial kingdom, uh, premillennialism would be a necessary outcome. But I'd say those four things, so passage priority, a distinction between the church and Israel, uh, a future for ethnic Israel, and a premillennial viewpoint, those would be the necessary components of dispensationalism. Like, in other words, you couldn't really be a dispensationalist without holding those necessarily. But then notice I didn't say a lot of other things. Like, I didn't even mention pre-tribulational rapture. And it may surprise some of the viewers to know that I actually have dispensational friends who aren't pre-trib. And mm -hmm. I have uh I have friends who who agree on the millennial idea and they're they're just, you know, post-trib. They say, hey, yeah, I agree with everything. I just don't agree with the details on the tribulational and uh rapture positions that you're presenting. And and I totally respect that. You know, I personally believe in pre-tribulational rapture, but I totally respect my brothers and sisters who disagree with me on that because I know those are difficult issues. And so I would say those four things are the main distinctions. Everything else, uh, you may find a dispensationalist who believes that, but that's not inherent to the system itself. That may say more about some of their background uh, or things of that nature. All right. So, uh, Peter, you know, you mentioned, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that here in just a second, but um, I think you know, Hollywood has, you know, done a poor job of kind of reflecting some of the things that you just mentioned in that there are varieties in dispensationalism and, you know, the culture portrays something very right. So, you know, how, how is cultural, the cultural view of dispensationalism different from, you know, the MacArthur view? 
Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I'm really glad you asked that because, you know, this, I think, is what drives both camps crazy. I think both camps, meaning dispensationalists and non-dispensationalists with as a broad camp, because there's so much talking past one another on this issue. And yeah, I just if I could get one point across, it would probably be this one is is that, you know, when you when you focus on like the Tim LaHaye version of dispensationalism or, you know, you're you're talking about the left behind series and somebody's getting their theology from a book. And listen, I know there are people like that. Um, I know that there are people who who have gotten their theology from movies, from books, and yet they've never picked up a Bible in their life. OK, I get that. The issue is that we need to be careful not to assume that that's everybody. There are definitely um, different forms. In fact, uh, I was talking with a non-dispensational friend about this, and uh, I was so happy when he told me this. He's like, you know, I just want you to know that I recognize that there's pop dispensationalism and then there's academic dispensationalism or like grounded dispensationalism. And I like, you know, hugged him. I said, thank you. Finally, you, you understand, you know, like there is, there's a difference here. And the reality is that nobody, at least, okay, I'm just speaking for myself, but I, I, I have a feeling I could speak for all my colleagues on this as well. Nobody is happy with the crazy dispensationalists. Okay. They, they're just, you know, crazy. And, you know, they, they get all excited about blood moons and they get all excited about, you know, like the next middle East conflict and stuff like that. And listen, we're the ones it's funny because in churches, like I, I help help out at church a lot in, in ministry. And, and, you know, sometimes people will be like, Hey, what about this? That's going on in the middle East. And I say, it's probably nothing like, you know, listen, like we need to have a perspective that, you know, it, it could lead to something, but at least right now, this is nothing that the Bible's talking about. And, and I see my brothers and sisters in well-grounded dispensationalism saying the same thing on Facebook and Twitter and all that. And so, you know, I'm encouraged that, you know, there's a realistic view of scripture and, and an understanding that people can go crazy. And my, my big contention on this, and the thing that I'd really want to just leave with the viewers on this is that the thing you have to be careful of if you're, if you're trying to argue against dispensationalism is just assuming that you're, you're winning if you're picking those guys to attack, because we all agree that they deserve to just go, you know, out to sea and be lost. You know, we, we understand that. Uh, and you're not, you're not winning if, if you're picking the fight against them. And so I guess in, in, in that sense, you know, it's, it's just a biblical principle. I think that when you have a popular movement, because everybody agrees that dispensationalism rose in popularity, um, whether that's good or not is really, I don't even think, um, correctly ascertainable yet. I, the, the big point though, is anytime you have a popular theological movement, you're going to have, as with any populist movement, a lot of riffraff and nominal Christianity attaching itself to that movement. And that's been historically the case in every situation. And even Paul warns in Acts 20 that from among the church, from among your own selves, will, or, will arise savage wolves who will deceive the flock. And so we just need to acknowledge that that's the case. You know, there are a lot of, I think this will make, this will make people very happy who are non-dispensationalists, I guess, but uh, but yeah, I think there are a lot of dispensational churches with dispensational pastors. I use that term, uh, with regard to kind of the paradigm I laid out earlier that are not real churches and are, the pastors aren't, aren't saved. The people in the churches aren't saved. I just think that that's, that's the truth. And that should surprise no one, um, be, just on the basis of how the devil works, um, within populist movements and all of that. But we just need to be careful not to lump everyone together. And so my encouragement would definitely be with dispensationalism. Uh, if you're trying to address it, if you want to really deal a death blow to it, you know, you have to deal with the best. Uh, and so, you know, you, and I have opinions as to who those would be. Like, I think my, my buddy and colleague, Mike Vlock is probably the best, like all his YouTube videos, all his books, you know, I think reading him, you know, if you're dealing with his arguments, I think you're going to be really well respected. You know, I think Corey Marsh, uh, Matt Waymeyer, Mike Spiegel from Dallas, all those guys are solid scholars. And I hope like I could be considered in a secondary conversation apart from them. But but it's just really important to deal with the best arguments. That's how that's how you engage on these levels. And 
And yeah, we're, we're with you. We, we understand, uh, and I'm speaking to the non-dispensationalists here, we're with you when we see kind of the riffraff and the nominal dispensationalism. But again, that's not inherent to the system itself. That's because it was a populist movement. And, you know, I think I think as a whole, the whole country, as we're all in agreement, has has seen its fair share of degradation. And so it's not uh, it's not that uh, dispensationalism itself uh, is is causing that. That's a bit of a debate. Um, it's I would argue the fact that we see a huge liberalization throughout America. That could be obviously a debated point. But the point being that there are different variations, strands of dispensationalism, and it, we would do well to just make sure we're focusing on the best uh, parts of the arguments. Yeah, good, thank you. Um, so, you know, going back to what you mentioned before with hermeneutics, what what type of presuppositions are you bringing to the start of the discussion that you would think probably differs from you know the way someone who uh, affirms covenant theology is going to come to the table yeah no that's and i i just really want to affirm that this is where the discussion has to be in fact i was so pleased when um sometimes i it's probably not healthy for me but i i, I like to join some of these eschatology groups on facebook you know, they're the post mill groups and the all mill groups. And like, I like to lurk, you know, I just, I don't like to argue. I just like to see what everyone's saying, you know? And I was so pleased because there were a few posts in some of these post mill groups that were like, wait a second, why are we arguing about passages with some of these dispensationalists? Shouldn't we be arguing about hermeneutics? And I just wanted to be like, yes, good job. Pat on the back for you. You know, like, and the reason is because if you're, if you're playing with different rules, you're never going to arrive at the same place. And so I think that that's where the debate needs to be. And if you can agree that this is how we should we should try to interpret Scripture, then you can have such a fruitful conversation for what Scripture means and how it would apply and all of that. But ultimately, that was something that was impressed upon me very early, and I was so thankful for that, is that almost every issue boils down to hermeneutics and just really how we, how we should expect to read the text and some of the presuppositions that we, that we bring. And we see that in every every kind of debate, not just theological debates, but I would say especially theological debates and, and reading scripture. So what what does that look like? So and and I would say I would want to be careful here because the things I'm about to say are not dispensationalist only positions. That would be a mistake. So in other words, um, like the things that I would propose, a dispensa a non-dispensationalist could still hold to it. But I would say that they're inherent to mm. the dispensational position. So somebody like, for example, I was talking to a, a post millennialist the other day. I was a couple of months ago now, but but he agreed with me on on many of these issues, and then just disagreed with how they worked out in different passages. And I love that because we had so many good conversations, and uh, he's a good brother. And and yeah, I think I think that's okay. But I think as a as a foundation what what we need to understand and this is what i went to earlier is that scripture has to be interpreted in line with the authorial intent of the original author and i, I used the supreme court um originalist you know living document dichotomy there as an example and i think that that's such a good one because if you remember some some viewers might remember the obergefell 2015 decision which legalized same sex marriage if you read that court document, which you know, I suppose if you need some sleep, you can do that. I'll put you to sleep. But what actually is crazy is to see how uh, the the liberal Supreme Court justices were arguing for same sex marriage about how oh we find this in the Constitution because we assume that the Constitution can change meaning and it really could mean this now and everything like that. And that's that's really dangerous. Obviously, it's dangerous from a constitutional perspective, but think about scripture. My my contention would be that if you go outside of an originalist intention uh, with usually the most common uh, form of this would be census plenior, where the the text can have a deeper meaning where the authorial intent of the human author and the authorial intent of the divine author are different. But that's dangerous because, uh, well, and 
I used to think that so I was like, this is common sense. Why would we why would we think that they have a different different viewpoint? But I do realize that it's 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 a lot more common now. And so I know that even some of the people viewing this would say, no, it's okay to believe that the divine author and the human author have different uh intentions behind what they're saying. And the human author doesn't need to know what the divine author intends behind it. But the problem with that is that on the one hand, that's never how human communication takes place. Uh, so this would have to be a very unique occurrence with how scripture uh, takes place. And okay, scripture is a miraculous book, but in line with that, how would we ever be assured of meaning? Because if, if scripture can have a different meaning than what the original author, the human author intended, then we, we really do lack a basis of certainty because we don't, we can never really know what the divine author intended. Now, some people might disagree with me and that's fine, but that's just how I would present the issue as an introduction. And so what a lot of people will argue as kind of a support for that is this idea of New Testament priority where the, the last the last uh, re revelation that God has given in the New Testament is the latest and greatest, as it were, and therefore it's clearest and dearest. I'm rhyming now. You know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, now that we have the New Testament, it helps us understand how we ought to have read the Old Testament. And, you know, that's actually a common, you know, that that's um, being a Reformed Baptist, um, you, you'll appreciate this, is that that's actually a common thread that often Pado baptists and Reformed Baptists argue over is, is are Reformed Baptists um, treating are fa falling prey or to, to this idea, or are they actually embracing, you know, a New Testament priority? I remember listening to a podcast by some Reformed Baptists, and they spent the whole podcast arguing how they were indeed using New Testament priority. And so their Pado baptist brothers should, should believe them because that's what the Pado baptist brothers were trying to argue for was a New Testament priority. And I'm not saying everyone believes that, but it's just become shocking to me that this is a huge presupposition for non-dispensational viewpoints a lot of times is to default to the New Testament. And my presupposition is that the Old Testament revelation had to mean something to the people that it was revealed to, and that the prophets that are giving revelation would understand it in a specific historical grammatical context. And so what that means then is that as you're, as you're presupposing that, that, that doesn't deny things like typology and things like that, but typology can often be used as an escape hatch or an ejection seat. You're just like, Oh, I don't like this passage hit the typology escape hatch, you know? And, and so people just appeal to that all the time. But the reality is that typology is, is very constricted. It's it's not like a get out of jail free card. There's actually, and unfortunately, because we're just doing a survey, you know, my mind's like, oh, it'd be so cool to walk through stuff like that. I mean, typology is such a great study, but what is wrong is you can't just appeal to typology whenever you feel like it. There's there's actual rules that are involved with that, and I think that that's that's helpful to to think through those. And and I would never deny the existence of typology. I don't think any dispensationalist would. But usually there's a there's a constraint there, uh, a presupposition on on my part, which says, okay, typology needs to be proven. You can't assume it. And what needs to be assumed until proven completely otherwise would be this idea that when the author is speaking, it means something to the people that he's speaking it to. And what would it have meant to them? And if if our interpretation is correct and we can leave it at that, then we should leave it there. That that would be a presupposition. And that's basically the, the presupposition I'm imposing. There would be something called confluence where the divine author and the human author are in tandem. And you know, my contention would be just from a logical standpoint, that would have to be the that would have to be the priority. Um, that's just how communication takes takes place. It's it's very rare. There there are a few exceptions, but it's very rare to have statements that have double meanings or or meanings within the meanings. Usually that takes a very clever um, joke or twist of, of words or something like that, but there are often contextual indicators when that happens. So, so when you, when you compare those with covenantalism, I'd say the biggest one, and I think, yeah, I think if I can, I guess, summarize and end it with this, it, when you compare a system like dispensationalism and covenant theology, one of the biggest, uh, biggest dividing lines would be this issue of New Testament priority is that when you have 
somebody interpreting an Old Testament text, they'll say, but the New Testament says this, therefore the Old Testament must not mean what, you know, just on a surface level, you might think it, it meant. And from my perspective, you're saying there's got to be a way to harmonize those um, because scripture is not going to be in, in conflict and there's real tangible meaning in the Old Testament. So that's kind of how I think through those. Now, there may be other ones as well, but I think that would probably be the the biggest presuppositional difference I see in a lot of non-dispensational systems versus dispensationalism. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, when, when talking about Israel and the church, you're probably used to guys like me, you know, taking you to passages and, you know, saying, well, these passages clearly show that there's no distinction between between Jew and Greek, right? So uh, questions or statements. Yeah. And well, I would add that I would be more scared uh, if you were asking me that because you could just dunk a basketball on me if, you know, you didn't didn't like what I was saying. So it's. You know, I think I think there's there's uh, more more respect given to somebody who could do that. So, no, I think I think this is an important issue, and I think it kind of illustrates some of the things that that we're talking about. So, I'm I'm really glad you asked this. Uh, so far, you've been asking the the greatest questions. So, I appreciate that, Ryan. So this so thinking about it from this perspective, it it, it partly brings in what we're talking about and then adds in a, just a, a element of typical or, or what I would view as an important hermeneutical process. So take some of these passages like Galatians 3.28, which is quoted all the time. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. Now, what's interesting about this, just a little background on myself, when I did my PhD at master's, it was actually during the Obergefeld uh, you know, whole situation and, and how much publicity that was making. And that was pretty much, you know, legalized pretty easily according to the Supreme Court. But what was happening during that time is that you had, you had the church debating this issue. And the issue was whether the church should accept homosexuality. And one of the things that that I found, like while I was while I was looking at what what those individuals were saying, is they were appealing to Galatians three twenty eight in the in a similar sense to how all of you know to a similar sense to how many people would argue against there being a difference between you know Gentile and Jew. They would often argue in the same way for there being no difference between male and female. In other words, there's a, we we need to get rid of this whole. A uh, complementarian viewpoint of roles between male and female, and because that's in my mind a huge argument against you know the acceptance of gay marriage is that there's a difference between men and women. I'm sure you're happy to hear me say this, by the way. There's a difference between men and women, and you know they they complement one another in marriage, and there there are specific roles that they need to observe. Well, the way that the the feminist and the egalitarian uh, and the pro you know homosexual marriage advocate would would argue is saying, well, look at what Galatians 3.28 says. It says there's no male or female. So it doesn't matter what the other passages say. This is the clearest text, which says there's no male or female. And therefore we need to apply that rubric across scripture. Now you see the problem with that, obviously. That's totally unfair. And it does just because in this specific context, Paul's making a point about equality in Christ and how we have equal benefits does not mean that there's no functional difference between man and woman. And so the same kind of point can be made with these kinds of verses with regard to Israel and the church. Paul's making a specific point to be sure. Uh, about equality in Christ and how uh, Jew and Gentile have that same relationship. They are, they are being given the spiritual blessings in Christ. Amen and amen. But just like the difference between male and female is still in existence post-Christ, I think we would have to, we, we would be in trouble to try to use those verses as kind of a bulldozer for the rest of scripture saying the rest of the passages mm. about the difference between Jew and Gentile are insignificant. They don't mean anything. There's no functional difference well, if you're going to do that, and and you know, I don't want to make anyone upset, but you understand what I'm saying is that you're basically arguing like the egalitarians. Uh, you're taking a passage like that and saying we need to run over the rest of Scripture with that, and I think that's a bad way to argue because each 
and it goes back to the hermeneutical presuppositions. If you take, if you take uh, the meaning of a passage to be found within that passage itself, for that reason, we can see that Paul's using those passages for specific arguments and he's making a specific rhetorical point, absolutely. But those aren't absolute statements that then can be run roughshod through scripture. And I think that, I think most people understand that. I just think sometimes we, f we forget about that and we, we again, you know, kind of, and this is again how I process that is we say, well, this is a very clear statement in scripture. And again, the idea is if we if we find a super clear statement in scripture, then maybe that can interpret other things that we we have trouble with. But but that's the difficulty is just because something is clear, it, it reads straightforward. That doesn't mean that that is can be our interpretive grid for everything else. And that same principle actually applies to all these other passages as well. I mean, a lot of people throw out like Romans 2 or Romans 9 saying, hey, look, you know, um, it's not the outward aspect of the Jew. It's it's the inward that counts. That means Gentiles can be can be Jews. Well, the thing I like to tell people is, is this. On the one hand, those passages could easily be interpreted as, as him saying, you can't have pride in your Jewish identity alone. It needs to be at the heart level. That's, that's what this whole purpose is about. And so he's talking to Jews in those passages that there's no, if there's no uh, debate about that, he's absolutely zeroing on Jews. The question is, does he mean that Gentiles can also be Jews? Or is he just saying that you need to, instead of trusting in your citizenship, act like what a Jew is truly supposed to entail? And the illustration I, I like to give about that is, is America. You know, it's, it's like there are people who have American citizenship and, you know, I might say something like they're not American, you know, they're not American because of what they do, what they stand for. They're going against the American ideals. And I might say they're not Americans, but then I might have friends who, who are foreign nationals who are here on a study visa or something like that. And I've said this to some of my friends, I'm like, you are a true American just because of who they are, what they stand for. It's just like, you know, I'm, I'm making a rhetorical point, but I'm not saying that they have a citizenship or anything like that. I'm making that rhetorical point, which, which by the way, that's actually what, uh, even in the new Testament, they do that all the time. If you think about, uh, John eight comes to mind because in John eight, the Jewish leaders actually call Jesus a Samaritan. And it's funny because nobody actually believes he's a Samaritan. They know his birth story. They know who, who he was born, but it's, a uh, it's essentially a a statement about what how they value him. They're saying you're a Samaritan, you're not a real Israelite. But they know he's a real Israelite, but they're just making a rhetorical point. And so the point is we have to allow those kinds of things. And a lot of those passages, um, I think rhetorically are are powerful. And even and here's the thing though, even if they were, let's I'll give the benefit of the doubt for a second. Even if they were to say that a Gentile is a Jew in that context. Again, we have to be careful. We can't just take that passage then and run roughshod through the Bible saying, let's let's erase every other clear text, which seems to make a difference between Jew and Gentile. And just because we've found one that that says in Paul's rhetoric, you are the real Jew because you are, you know, inwardly devoted to God, you know, Romans 2 kind of idea. Again, we would have to say, okay. Even if that's true, which by the way, I actually have dispensational friends who do take that view of Romans 2. They say, no, he's calling Gentiles Jews there. But they have no problem with understanding that this is this is a rhetorical point by Paul, similar to my illustration of saying, no, you're the real American. You're the one who's standing up for what it always intended to be. But we can't use that as a hermeneutical key then to interpret the rest of scripture. That's just not how scripture was was revealed. And so you have other instances on that where you know, sim similar kind of idea where you have Paul use terminology that related to Israel and he relates it to the church. But it's really, I think, in my opinion, it's the same kind of principle. And I think we can see that, like, for example, Philippians 3 is a big one where he says, you know, um, we are the true circumcision. We are the circumcision. Well, sure, you could interpret that to say that the real circumcision doesn't matter anymore, that the Jews don't matter. We are the true Jews. You could take it to mean that. But again, you you really just got to look at the rest of Scripture. In fact, I found it, I was reading through the New Testament the last few months, and I found it really interesting after I read through Philippians, where Paul says that in Colossians, just a few chapters later in our Bibles, Paul makes a point where he says, 
you know, only, only, uh, I think it was justice and Mark of the circumcision are with me, but of the Gentiles, these guys are with me, you know, talking about those people in the church. And I was thinking, wait, so he's okay in Colossians four talking, even though Philippians says, you know, we are the circumcision. Then he in Colossians four uses circumcision to refer to the Jewish Christians. And then he lit, and we know that because he specifically says, and the rest are also with me. And he lists the Gentiles. And, you know, so the point is you can't just take one passage of scripture and use that as a grid for the rest. You have to interpret things within their own context. And I think that that's, that's helpful uh, to, to remember that because it, it, in one sense, it might seem like the right pathway or easy to take, take a passage, which you think is clear and then run the rest of the biblical gambit with it. But, but that's really not hermeneutically responsible because we have to allow for variation of terms Actually, and I know I know you probably wanted to move on for this question, but I just thought of another thing. On that, the a lot of people appeal to the seed of Abraham thing, right? And so um, the seed of Abraham, they say, well, look, Galatians 3, we are called, the church is called seed of Abraham. Boom, like slam dunk, toast. Like dispensationalists are idiots. They don't know what they're talking about. It's like, yeah, we've never heard that argument before. You know, well, you know, it's, it's and, re and really, you know, I, I think people could with, with today's technology and word searches and all that, you could easily just double check this is just check how many different contexts there are for seed of Abraham. And you'll find at least, at least four, probably five or more different individuals or entities that are called the offspring of Abraham. And so which one do you use? Uh, you, you know, you have both faithful and unfaithful Israel being called the descendants of Abraham. You have uh, Esau being called the descendants of Abraham and his family. Uh, you have uh, Ishmael. Uh, you know, you have all these people who are labeled it with the terminology of the seed or offspring. It's the same term in the original languages uh, of Abraham. And then you have Jesus, who's called the ultimate seed of Abraham. So corporately, he's obviously there. And then you have the Gentiles, those who believe, in, the Gentiles who are called the seed of Abraham. So it's not like there's just a monolithic way of interpreting that. There are, and, and I think that's a big, a big point of responsible, faithful biblical study is to say, you know, it's it's sometimes not simple. There are there are complexities to this, and authors can use phrases differently. And his point in Galatians 3 is that we are related to Abraham through faith because he was the father of faith. That's Romans 4. And amen and amen, we absolutely agree to that, and there is no salvation in any other way except by grace through faith. And anyone who denies that should be anathema, right? But but to say that that means that there's no more other usage of offspring of Abraham would be, I think, a little, a little bit disingenuous. But you know, what do I know? You know. Yeah. Well, if if anyone thinks that we've been really easy on you so far, let's ask a couple of loaded questions now. Perfect. Okay? So, <laughs> um, does Jesus reign as King now? What does that mean? All right. I love it. I actually really, really do love this question. And these are the kinds of questions that really give good conversation pieces because you can define things. You can look at what you mean by what you say. And so I, I just really excited for this. So I think, okay, there has never been, this is how I would say it. There has never been a time where Jesus has not reigned and you say, well, wait a second, what are you talking about? Well, you just got to read the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is super clear that, you know, Psalm 91, 99, the Lord reigns, right? The Lord reigns. He reigns absolutely. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. Like this is, this is, you know, absolute. And we believe in the Trinity, you know, the, the eternal God. And so Jesus is, has always been a part of that. In fact, in Isaiah 6, specifically, um, Isaiah has this vision of the Lord seated in his temple ruling, right? And John 12 says that I, that Isaiah spoke concerning him referring to Jesus. And so I think, you know, it's, it's interesting because there, th this is, I think often the missing part of the discussion when I, when I hear this, this kind of conversation going on is that Jesus is pictured as reigning even in the old Testament. And so the question is, 
what, and I know this is kind of where you're going with the question. Um, so that's why I think it's so good is, is what is it that changes to the new Testament? Um, what kind of reigning are we talking about there? And, and that's, yeah, I love that. What, what is what does it mean? And that's where I think we need to understand that, that as a background, what we're really asking is when does David, or sorry, like, when does Jesus ascend the throne of David? That's that's like the real tangible question that we can ask because Jesus reigns as sovereign God. Absolutely. He he has never, you know, relinquished that. But does Jesus reign as the Davidic heir right now? That's a very specific, tangible question that we can ask. And I think the best part about this is scripture has so much information on this too. And I would, and obviously I'm going to front this and say that I think a lot of people would disagree with with my conclusion on this and admittedly even some dispensationalists would but i would say that i i think that scripture has so much to say about this issue uh that i think it it really is helpful to have all these passages to dive into so track track my argument here and you can agree with it or disagree with it or you know kick it out to the trash but you know, Second Samuel seven is the key starting point. Is that the Davidic throne is granted to David and his descendants, and it's uh, situated in the location there in Israel. Like Second Samuel seven, very clear. In fact, in Second Chronicles seven, which is a passage a lot of people don't reference, after Solomon completes the temple, God appears to him, and in Second Chronicles seven, I think it's somewhere around like seventeen and eighteen. I don't know I just taught it in Old Testament studies not too long ago, but but basically. God tells Solomon, you know, I'm fulfilling what I promised to David and I'm establishing your throne here in Jerusalem. And, you know, Psalm 132, which is one of the divine commentaries on the Davidic covenant, explicitly identifies that God has chosen Zion for the seat of the Davidic covenant. Now, when you, so, so from the Old Testament, I would say it's very, very clear that the Davidic covenant links the throne of David with the kingdom of Israel and Jerusalem as a specific city. Now you say, okay, well, all right, what does the New Testament do? Doesn't the New Testament change something about that expectation? Well, not really. When Gabriel appears to Mary in Luke 1, he actually promises her that Jesus will reign on the throne of David and rule over the nation of Jacob. That, In other words, there's basically direct continuity with the promise of the Old Testament. And mm -hmm. it's it's interesting because when Jesus talks about his his future ascension um, and and the future expectation of ruling, uh, Matthew 19, 28 is such a key passage. And I think that that's one, I think that's one that a lot of eschatological positions struggle with. But it's it's very powerful because what Jesus says to his disciples, and this is the context of the rich young ruler, Peter wonders, well, what are we going to get, you know, for giving up everything and following you? And Jesus responds to him and says, you know, truly, I say to you, in the new world, the the regeneration, when when all things are made new, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, so future tense, when he will do that, you who followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So what you have there is a very future-oriented text where Jesus says, there's going to come a time where I'm going to sit on a throne and you're going to sit on a throne with me and we're all going to rule over Israel. And you might say, okay, well, that could be, that could have already happened. It's future to Matthew 19, but maybe it's already happened. Maybe it happened at the ascension. I mean, that's that's definitely a valid possibility, except that later on in Matthew, Jesus actually qualifies when that's actually going to take place. And that's found in Matthew 25. Um, I think it's verse 31. But in Matthew 25, 31, Jesus says at that time when the Son of Man comes, and almost every eschatological position, except I guess full preterist, almost every eschatological position views Matthew 25 as the future second coming. And when it says, when the Son of Man comes with his angels all around him, then it uses a chronological sequence marker. Then, in other words, at that time, he will sit on his glorious throne. And so it uses the same terminology as Matthew 19, giving us the time frame for when that's going to take place. Is at the second coming, that's when he's going to ascend the throne and rule. Okay. So if we if we link all those passages together, I think it's 
pretty conclusive. If, you, if you're just doing a biblical theological study of, of throne and looking at how that works, uh, again, people aren't going to just say it's that easy, but that's the, the beauty of this subject is you can actually research these passages and, and see, I'm not just making it up. You know, there, there is a, there is a sequence given in those passages about when he will ascend to the throne. And I think Matthew 25, 31 is a good example of that. And I would say this too, well, two, two things on that. One, I think it makes sense from a, from a holistic biblical theological standpoint, because the Davidic king is given the rule and responsibility to finish what Adam uh, had had been destined to do. Adam failed, and the Davidic king, who ends up being Jesus as the fulfillment of that, but the, through the Davidic covenant, Jesus is given the rule and responsibility to do what Adam failed to do. But if Adam was tasked to rule the earth from the earth, then Jesus, in Adam's stead, can't rule the earth from heaven. Now, again, that's keeping in distinction, uh, keeping in distinction what I said, Jesus is always ruling, always reigning in the general sense, in the sovereign sense of him being God, but there's a specific Davidic sense, I would argue, obviously these are my arguments, uh, I would argue that he, in order to fulfill what Adam failed to do, he needs to be here on earth like Adam to rule over the world. And interestingly enough, that's, that's what Hebrews 2 says. Uh, Hebrews 2 quotes Psalm 8 and, you know, about um, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him. That's basically a Davidic commentary on Genesis 1 in light of the Davidic covenant. So David is meditating on the amazing responsibility that God has given to his, his offspring. And the author of Hebrews says, now we don't see this, though, or this applies to Jesus, but we do not see things in submission to his feet yet. Like all things are not under his feet yet. Now, some people could say, well, it's talking about a continuous uh, propagation that that eventually will get everything in submission to him. But in reality, what it's just saying is that we don't see this happening yet, but it will happen in the future. So it's just a matter of interpretation of whether that's going to happen when he comes or whether the church is supposed to achieve that first and then Christ will come later. Obviously, I have opinions on that. But the point is that that's that seems to fit well biblical in a biblical theological standpoint. Although I would say somebody could easily say, well, where's Jesus sitting now? He's obviously at the right hand of the Father. What in the world is that? And I would say the the biblical story gives us the answer to that too in Revelation 3.21. In Revelation 3.21, uh, Jesus is talking to the churches there, and he says, to the one who conquers, I'll grant him the authority to sit on my throne as I also conquered and sit on my father's throne. And so from my perspective, what's going on now is Jesus is reigning and ruling from the Father's throne, according to Revelation 3.21, and then there will come a time when he comes and conquers the world and reigns from the Davidic throne in Jerusalem and exercises the mandate of Adam over the whole earth. Okay, so if, if we come with the presupposition that there is a distinction between Israel and the church, right? Uh, what do you believe then is in store in the future for Israel? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. So again, uh, this, you know, I, I'm going to be like a broken record. So it's it's uh, always going back to my presuppositions. Is my presupposition is that the Old Testament gives us a foundation, and then that's not contradicted in the New Testament. It's just further explained and given maybe some chronological details, etc. In fact. Um, can I say something super controversial? We'll see if like I get chewed out on social media for this. I'll, I'll do it. It'll get you good ratings to say something super controversial here. Um, I would say All right. just for All right. exercise sake, uh, yeah. I would challenge every viewer to say, okay, what would happen if I only had the Old Testament? If I only had the Old Testament, I know everyone's already like, heresy, heresy. Okay, I'm not, this is not how I interpret the Bible. But if you only had the Old Testament, what would your eschatological position be? Would it be different uh, than having the New Testament, right? My contention would be that the best eschatological position should be the same if you only have the Old Testament and you also add in the New Testament, right? So, and obviously I'm I'm biased. I'm saying that that's what, what my viewpoint tries to do. And in the Old Testament, it just gives a very clear uh 
clear from the beginning, I would say too, I was talking to a colleague about this, to, to Dr. Vlock. He, he had mentioned, he was just really fascinated by this, is that the same eschatological picture is found in Genesis, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. All of these passages teach a coming exile. Uh, there, there, there are significant passages in the Pentateuch, so very, very early, where you have the exile promised for, for Israel. In fact, that's in my Old Testament classes, I say, what a discouraging message that Moses gives the people. He's saying, we're almost in the land. By the way, as soon as we get to the land, you're going to mess up and then you're going to go into exile. So you have, you know, exile promised for the people. And then you have very, like, encouragingly though, um, I suppose, well, I guess the first thing is that as, as part of that exile, they're actually going to turn against their Messiah. They're going to pierce him themselves. Zechariah 12 is, is big about that. Uh, Isaiah 53 as well. You're going to kill your own Davidic king. You're going to pierce him, but then you are going to repent. You're going to return to the land. You're going to repent. You're going to, well, even before the repentance, so I should say there is a severe punishment as part of the day of the Lord that you're going to go through. And as part of that, though, you'll repent. Yahweh himself will return, uh, save you, and then he will restore you to prominence and, and elevate you. That, And I could give passages for that. That's just like a, a broad survey of what the Old Testament teaches. And I don't think there's much of a debate about that. I mean, the Old Testament prophets are very clear about that. Uh, the only... The only question is whether or not those promises can be reinterpreted or reconfigured or things like that. And of course, my hermeneutical model says, if we don't have to reinterpret things, why would we? Um, it seems like that should be a big part of our, uh, our presuppositions is that as normal communication takes place, that's what is supposed to happen. You know, and a big question about Israel's restoration uh, often is is like the rebuilding of the temple and things like that. Uh, I would say, well, as part of that prophetic picture of Israel's restoration, there are there are passages galore about the temple uh, being rebuilt. Um, now, I, I think a lot of people, you know, assume that dispensationalists are just crazy, just thinking that the temple is going to be rebuilt. But there are so many passages. I mean, everyone knows Ezekiel 40 to 48, but that's that's really only one of them. There, there's a lot of them. Ezekiel 40 to 48 is the most well-known, but it, it talks about a future temple being rebuilt. Everyone argues about the dimensions, saying, how could that be a real temple, yada, yada. Okay, but what about Zechariah 6? In Zechariah 6, you have a specific messianic passage, and a lot of people know it because that's one of the, uh, other than Psalm 110, it's where the Messiah is linked with the with the throne and with the priesthood. So it's it's the king priest dynamic and and Zechariah 6 says this is going to happen is that the king is going to come and he's going to rule as a priest as well. Like he's going to be the priest and the king and everyone wonders how that's going to be, but they do well. Uh in, in the um Hebrews kind of explains how how that can take place. But in Zechariah 6 verse 13 it specifically says that this individual is going to come and it's he who shall build the temple and and then he will rule on his throne and you, you say okay that's that's pretty explicit uh that this messianic individual is going to build the temple now of course we could spiritualize that you know that's that's a that's a possibility saying well he's talking about the church there that's that's a echo of the church but again going with the originalist hermeneutic what what did zechariah mean when he said that what did the people hear when he said that? And I think that that's a valid question to understand. But then you have other other uh, other passages like Isaiah two, talking about when the nations streamed to Israel uh, in the latter days. It says that you know the people are going to come into the house of the God of Jacob. So there it seems to be a temple reference. You have Haggai two six through nine, which talks about a rebuilt temple, and then you also have uh, an odd passage, which. Um, I was encouraged to to hear that even some post millennialists like Doug Wilson view as actually still future, and that's Second Thessalonians two. So even some post mills say that it, it's still future, but I don't think that they would um, think that it's uh, that there's going to be an actual rebuilt temple. But Second Thessalonians two says that there's going to be a temple in which the man of lawlessness is going to come and declare himself to be God, and if that's still future, huh. uh, you got to do something with that. 
And so I respect uh, people like Wilson, who, even though they have like a post mill viewpoint, they say, well, I think this is still something in the future. And and I think it, it fits well with a view like mine, because you're saying, yeah, I I would believe that there's going to be a temple rebuilt. And uh, now it, it just so happens, actually, if you put that together, though, the second Thessalonians two temple would actually happen before Christ returns. So apparently there's going to be some pagan temple uh, that that secular Judaism rebuilds beforehand. Um, so so it's funny because as Christians, we're not really cheering for any temple to be rebuilt now because that's that's not sanctioned by God, but it's going to happen, at least according to my viewpoint, at some point. And so it's, you know, I think the the Old Testament prophets are are complex in how they talk about that, but not not in under not in a way that we can't understand. Now again, we can we can argue all day long about whether those should be taken allegorically or whatever, but the big point is they do talk about a, a temple in the future, and so it's not crazy that somebody would believe that. We're just trying to trying to do with what the prophets have clearly talked about, and then trying to do something with it. Well, I, I think maybe maybe to follow up on that, I think I'm gonna I think I'm just gonna ask one more question. I think this will be a good one to end with. Um, all Israel will be saved. How do you interpret that? Uh, the jokester in me wants to say the right way, but of course, uh, that will win me no friends, right? So, uh, yes. So how, how would I interpret that? So assuming that the Old Testament prophets got it right. Okay. Again, like, and okay. Now everyone understands who I am. Okay. You, you mentioned that I, that I teach at the shepherd's seminary and I'm an Old Testament uh, professor. Okay. It all, it comes out now, you know, like I'm always going back to the old Testament. Uh, and, but, but actually true story. The reason I got my PhD in old Testament was because, uh, I realized that the new Testament was written to people who knew their old Testament and I had no clue what was in my old Testament. And so I realized, okay, I really need to learn the old Testament. And so that's where I got my PhD. Cause I realized I knew nothing. So, uh, assuming that the old Testament prophets did get it right, assuming that they you know were prophesying correctly about this expectation of a kingdom which is going to happen on behalf of the repentance of Israel the return of the Messiah etc I think that that makes sense that what we see in Romans 9 through 11 fits with that because Paul you, you know and Paul's looking he writes this amazing theological discourse to the Roman Church and Romans 9 through 11 is often viewed as just kind of like, ah, maybe it's a parenthesis or something like that, but really it's a central component of his argument. And part of the part of the big discussion there is if God is so faithful and he's, he's sovereign and he's, you know, working through the gospel and everything like that, why is it that what we read about in the Old Testament is not happening? Why is it that there's just it seems to be such a disconnect from what we would expect. And so Romans 9 through 11 gives us a really good perspective on that. And some of the things that he points out, uh, like, for example, in verse 12 of Romans 11, he he says, now, if their trespass, so that's talking about the trespass of the Jews, how the Gentiles have been grafted in. Uh, now, if the trespass of the Jews mean riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, then how much more will their full inclusion mean? In other words, he seems to be saying, listen, life's not over for the for the Israelites yet. And he says, um, if you're being blessed so much, even when Israel is in disobedient, like they're, they're in disobedience and you are receiving all this blessing, can you imagine the amount of blessing you're going to get when they are obedient and their inclusion is full? And Really, that calls to mind so many Old Testament prophecies where Israel is the conduit of blessing. Now, I know many of my Reformed brothers and sisters will say, well, yes, Israel was the conduit of, of blessing because they they were you know the, the venue of the Messiah. The Messiah came through the line of Israel. But that's only part of it, at least in, in my view, or how you interpret the prophets, is that they, they give an expectation of so much more. All these blessings are going to flow, and the prophets, you know, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, Zechariah 14, the nations flood through Jerusalem to receive the blessing and all that. And so Paul makes an argument which sounds a lot like those Old Testament prophets where he says, listen, like right now, while Israel is in timeout, they're in disobedience, then, you know, you can be assured that when their full inclusion is here, just think about how much more blessing is going to come. 
And in, in a couple of verses later in Romans mm -hmm. 11, uh, well, we're in Romans 11, in verse 20, 25, he says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And that phrase there really kind of gives like a temporal sequ sequence about what we're seeing. And it's basically, uh, you know, a direct connection with what Jesus was talking about in Luke 21 when, when he was talking about what's going to happen to Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem's going to be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Well, what actually is fascinating about that is that both of those statements, the, the times of the Gentiles, that actually alludes to Zechariah, because the way Zechariah is, is uh, patterned and you know outlined, you basically have the times of the Gentiles uh, basically outlined in you know Zechariah 9 through 11, essentially, and then you have uh, the times of Israel uh, in Zechariah 12 with their repentance through 14 with the kingdom. And so it seems like Paul is very aware of the prophets and, and Jesus himself as well. And they're saying, listen, there's going to be a time where Israel is really being trampled. They're, they're being um, devastated by the Gentiles. Uh, and But both Jesus and Paul allude to the fact that this isn't a forever circumstance. Jesus himself said, you know, Jerusalem will be trampled until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So that's a temporal cessation there. In other words, he's saying at the when the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled, Jerusalem will stop being uh, stop being uh, trampled. And then I would link in there when Jesus says, you know, at that, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, there will come a time where Jerusalem will turn to Jesus and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so in that expectation, Paul kind of feeds in that with Romans 11 saying, listen, we know a partial hardening has come upon Israel until that time period, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And the very next verse in 26, he says, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. In other words, at that point, at that turning stop, Israel is going to be saved. And I take that, you know, a lot of people have you know, I, I'm trying to limit myself in going all the views. I'm just trying to give like what I think just for time's sake. But but basically, there is in my mind no difference between that kind of thought process and what we read in the Old Testament prophets. Obviously, you knew I was gonna say that. Everyone knew I was gonna say that, right? Uh I a lot of people, and I, I've been I've been happy with this. A lot of people have said, you know, I'm so, you know, I do believe that there's gonna be a future salvation for the for Israel, you know. Amen and amen. Well, the reality is, though, that why would we assume that this salvation that Paul's talking about is anything different than what the Old Testament prophets talked about? I, I would say the burden of proof is on somebody who wants to say that Paul is changing things from what the Old Testament prophets said, because they all said that there would be uh, a salvation for all of Israel, uh, that it would be a national geographical revival, that they would be returned to their land, that they would be saved, all, of the, all that language. And then are we to assume that Paul says, well, they will just be saved. There's not going to be a revival of the kingdom. There's not going to be a... No, I think I think the burden of proof would definitely be, have to be on somebody who wants to shortchange that, especially since Paul says the, the gifts and callings of God are, are irrevocable, right, in that same section of scripture. And, well, it, it's interesting how that section even ends because a lot of people... You know, now you now I'm going off on a tangent here, but the the last uh, I think it's verse 28. Um, Paul says, Paul says that uh, in talking about the contemporary nation of Israel during that time, he says they are enemies of the gospel, but they are beloved with regard to their election. And I think that that really hits the nail on the head. A lot of people struggle with how to view Israel right now, and I think. You know, we could just use Paul's words. They are currently enemies of the gospel because they're unsaved, they're rebellious, they are in they are in rebellion against Yahweh, but they are still beloved according to their election. And you know, I and from my perspective, obviously, I know I'm um, speaking to uh, a majority of group that wouldn't agree with me, but but from my perspective, you know, this this fits really well with the Old Testament picture of an expectation of a return to Christ, uh, a looking a Zechariah 12 experience where they look on him whom they have pierced, 
and they mourn as one mourns for an only child. And it's at that point that all of Israel will be saved. Zechariah 13, 1 says the, the floodgates of blessing will open upon them. Zechariah 14 says Yahweh will return, will save them, and then will establish his kingdom. And I think that that makes a lot of sense, uh, at least in my head. Yeah. Uh, well, Peter, I know I've had the, uh, I've had the easy job here, um, but I've had a blast, and I, I hope you have too. Uh, I really, really appreciated you, brother. Um, appreciated your your disposition and um, just just how you responded. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for for joining us. Um, you know, I will I will say here at some point in the future, you you do need to uh, get up to to uh, Indiana, uh, get up to Hoosier country, um, and see some real basketball here uh, at some point. But yeah, oh, nonetheless, man. Yeah, well, thanks uh, for thanks for letting me come on, Ryan. I know you you shortchanged yourself though. You're the one who came up with the questions, so I I appreciate the good job and yeah, just making it uh, really accessible. And you know, I think people will benefit from it, or at least I hope they do. So thanks for the good work on that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again for your time. Um, again, wanting to wanting to to show um, our listeners um, that you know the, the gospel is of the utmost importance. Um, and we can, uh, you know, put aside some of our differences for, you know, the sake of, of unity, uh, in Christ, flesh some of this out and thank you for, uh, for all your work and all your time. So, um, we'll wrap up with that today. Um, look forward to, uh, seeing, uh, you all again next time here on es Eschatology Matters, and hopefully we will, uh, uh, have a chance to bring Peter back on at some point in the future. So thanks, Peter. Seated here at my right hand.